introduce Olivier uh, Vanderhaar. Uh, he worked, uh, his uh, uh, right from the beginning, fell in love with uh, migmatites, working on variscan migmatites in French massive uh, central during his uh, bachelor degree. He, he followed with a master degree at University of Montpellier in 1991. And when after it, he took uh, two years uh, to work with uh, a BRGM uh, in French Guiana, uh, working on the Paleoproterozoic Basin gold mineralization. After it, he decided to go back to academia, did PhD in 1997 at the University of uh, Minnesota. Uh, at that time, he focused on structural analysis of migmatite. Uh, and coupled it with geochronology and thermochronology and in, um, sort of worked out the impact of partial melting on orogenic evolution. He followed uh, with a postdoctoral position at Dalhousie University between 1997 and 1999, uh, where he developed um, thermomechanical uh, modeling of orogenic belts and uh, developed a channel flow model. Uh, after it, he was hired at the University of Nancy as assistant prof associate professor in 1999 and uh, uh, moved uh, all the way to the head of the geology department. Uh, at the same time, he developed research activity on magma and fluid transfer during crustal growth and differentiation and application uh, to, uh, to mineral system and uh, worked in cyclades, alpine belt, uh, French Massif Central, Variscan belt, Greenville belt in uh, North America and Pan-African belt, belts around Congo Craton. Uh, recently, well, relatively recently, he moved to Toulouse uh, where he is a full professor. Um, he moved in 2014 and he developed a new uh, research directions now in deep geothermal. So with this, I pass it to Olivia. Uh, so it's all yours. Olivia, you're still muted. Yeah, we can't hear you. You're still muted. Okay, that should be fine now. Yeah, we can hear you. Great. I have to share my screen. Here it is. Okay, well, thanks very much, Alex and Andre, for giving me this uh, opportunity and us the opportunity to discuss uh, things on the topics of Precambrian geology, uh, especially in these times of uh, well, great difficulty to, to have exchanges. I think it's a, it's a very good, very nice uh, way to do it, even though I prefer to, to see you all and discuss in a, in a lively uh, atmosphere. Uh, anyways, we do what we can in the time being, and today I want to talk to you about dynamics of coastal routes and to match the, the topic of these seminars uh, on Precambrian geology. I, I want to compare, I would like to compare today uh, uh, different settings of, more young, uh, of younger uh, segments of uh, continental crust uh, with uh, Archean to Proterozoic uh, se segments. And we'll see what we can gain from these examples in order to understand uh, Archean geodynamics, but the geodynamics in, or, or in a general context in, in general terms. And the key here is to, that we will go from million years to billion years uh, with these examples, and we'll see how the dynamics of coastal routes uh, is uh, impacting coastal differentiation on these different scales. And the tools that I want to I will use is a multi-method approach with uh, first, first of all, field geology, structural analysis in the field. And here is the, an example of the Naxos Dome in Greece. Uh, we'll then use also petrology and combined with uh, geochronology 
So in other words, petrochronology, uh, mostly on zircon grains, which are a great tool to decipher the timing of uh, geological processes, and also numerical modeling uh, that will uh, be based on the, the, the geological data that are gathered on these different uh, settings. Uh, before starting in, and getting into the guts of the talk, I would like to uh, thank all my collaborators uh, during these years on the different projects uh, that also implied uh, number of PhD and master students, and some of them are, are attending today. And I thank you to be there to the two, and I hope that I will not uh, uh, too much bias their, their own views. Okay, so uh, Asian continental nuclei, what are we talking about? They are, most of the continents are caught by this uh, Archean nuclei, and are then uh, surrounded by proterozoic to phanerozoic belts. A typical example of such a craton is the West uh, Australian craton with the Pilbara craton, which is made of uh, greenstone belts, of made themselves composed of metavolcanics and uh, metasediments and the low grade green schist to amphibolite facies. And these are surrounding large scale domes, crossal scale domes, you know, 20 to 30 kilometer wide domes, caught by granites gnases and actually migmatites. Migmatites that uh, we will see in details what they, what they represent. And basically they represent formerly partially molten crust. So if we look at the metamorphic record of, of uh, the Pilbara and the Barberton, for example, uh, cratons, we see that uh, the, it, they, they, they correspond to uh, high temperature amphibolite facious rocks, which is consistent with a geothermal gradient, which is fairly high with uh, eight to 900 degrees at 30 to 40 kilometers at the Moho depth. Looking at the uh, geochronologic data on the Pilbara and Barberton the cratons, we also see that there is a prolonged uh, record of uh, juvenile magmatism, juvenile accretion, depicted here by uh, uh, neodymium um, model ages, and also uh, a long history of crystal crystal reworking here uh, illustrated by uranium lead ages on zircon. And for these cratons, these ages spread from 3.5 billion years to 2.7 billion years with a, a fairly continuous record, which is, that is an important point that we'll come back uh, later on. So in order to uh, uh, account for this prolonged and widespread magmatism and high temperature metamorphism, uh, several models have been proposed. And some of them we have already discussed in the previous uh, sessions uh, that were devoted to this type of, uh, of, uh, of geological settings. Uh, one of them is a flat plunge subduction here proposed by Beaker and Hall 2007 for the slave craton. Uh, so the flat subduction is uh, proposed to account for the widespread magmatic activity and uh, uh, prolonged during several tens of million years to, to account for the, the, the record, the ge geochronological record of this, this area. Another way to, to account for this record is to have multiple subduction zones and repeated subduction uh, in order to cover both the uh, real extent of magmatism and the uh, time during which this magmatism is active. And this is present, proposed by Percival and, and Skolsky for the Superior Province. And that was uh, challenged uh, two or three weeks ago by uh, Jean Bédard uh, and that proposed another model for, for, the, for the same type of uh, data. And here is uh, uh, one of the figures from, from Jean uh, Bédard's yeah, work. Yeah. Olivia, yeah. let me let me interrupt you. Just there is some periodic uh, issues with your connection, so I think it would might be good just to maybe turn your video off. Hopefully, okay. that will help. That's fine. I do. All right. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's better that <laughs> I interrupt my, my video than rather than people don't understand. And, and okay, it's better like this. I think yeah. I think this will be better. 
So here's the figure, the, the, the illustration by uh, Jean Beda. Uh, and in order to explain the same uh, features, prolonged and widespread magmatism and high temperature metamorphism, we propose a multiple plume uh, model whereby the uh, plumes are interacting with the, the crust uh, in, in several pulses. And that explains the same type of, of uh, geological record. So the same questions arise for the Paleoproterozoic, with here uh, a scenario proposed by uh, Lenka Baratu and, and co-authors, co uh, where they didn't decide between the multiple or flat uh, subduction and the proposed both uh, in order to account for, uh, for this type of uh, geological record. And this, in, in the Paleoproterozoic uh, Iberian West African Craton, this period of uh, mythic magmatism was then uh, uh, su su succeeded by uh, more felsic, uh, emplacement of felsic magmas uh, forming domes, just as the, the Pierbera one. And uh, later on, uh, more evolved magmas emplaced uh, at the end of the, the Ebionian uh, origin. Similarly, Laurent et al. in 2014 put, uh, made a synthesis of uh, magmatic trends of different cratons, Archean cratons, and they show that there is a systematic uh, single differentiation trend, uh, starting with TTGs in yellow, and then uh, followed up by uh, Sanuketoids, high K uh, granitoids, with uh, potentially uh, man mantle contribution, and then hybrid granitoids, followed by biotite and tumica granites with a paraluminous signature. And uh, they proposed uh, that these different uh, magmatic uh, signatures are correlated to uh, different stages of orogenic evolution from uh, subduction to uh, construction and thickening of the continental crust and all the way to orogenic collapse. Okay, so we are here with uh, the two main uh, characteristics that I want to discuss today, prolonged and widespread magmatism and high temperature metamorphism, and the single goal differentiation trend for these regions. Are these, what do these tell us about plumes or platelets, or, 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 name, or in other words, in term, how, how do they relate to plate tectonics or plumes? How, how do they relate to a general dynamics? And what do they tell us about the dynamics of coastal routes? Well, we move from Archean now to, uh, to more recent origin belts to search for keys to address these issues. Let's start with uh, Naxos, so a real young one. Naxos in the middle of the Alpine origin belt, so Cenozoic. And Naxos is actually, sorry, use my pointer here. So Naxos is here, right in the middle of the Aegean domain, very nice uh, Greek island. Uh, and it, formed, it, it has recorded the full orogenic cycle as in the context of convergence between Africa and Eurasia that is accommodated by subduction of a single slab that is retreating, retreating from north to south during the last uh, uh, 70 million years. And this resulted in accretion of Tethian units to the Eurasian margin that has been also associated with high pressure, low temperature metamorphism at first, and then followed on by high temperature metamorphism. So Naxos has recorded all these events with, uh, so it has a dome shape with a, a dome that is called by nucleotides that we'll talk just afterwards. But first, Naxos has preserved uh, high pressure, low temperature relics dated at 50 million years, affecting a, a series of schists and marbles of Cygnozoic, uh, sorry, Mesozoic uh, protolith that, uh, that, is the, that corresponds to the, the passive margin of the uh, Eurasian continent. Uh, and this, this high pressure, low temperature metamorphism has was dated at 50 million years. And then this 
partly to uh, totally uh, reset it by overprinted by uh, uh, green cheese fascias to amphibolite fascias metamorphic uh, gradient that uh, increases towards the uh, center of the island marked by this dome called by migmatites. These migmatites have been dated by uh, uranium lead on, on zircon around 30 to 20 million years. And all these, uh, these metamorphic rocks are intruded then by a granodiorite pluton dated at 11 million years. And all these crystalline rocks are juxtaposed to uh, supercrystal rocks and sediments, detrital sediments, along a low angle detachment. Uh, and these sediments are, have almost the same age as the granodiorite. So it's, uh, it's very rapid, the exhumation of the crystalline rocks. So we'll see now the, the migmatite dome, the marble and schists, and, and how they relate to each other. Well, first, the marble and, and schists, they, they appear very nice, nicely on the, the, on the scenery, and it's easy to reconstruct the, the fold and refolded structure associated with uh, tectonic accretion and uh, during subduction and then exhumation of these crustal units. And these uh, folded with uh, before the falls are then uh, deformed by the formation of the dome at the lower structural level that is caused by migmatites. And if we look closer in the migmatites, that are the, the, the first order dome is here delineated by a marble layer. And within the migmatites, we see even subdomes that we'll talk uh, just afterwards. So the dome structure overprints the refolded naps, which means that it is, uh, it is later that the dome formed, it formed later than the, the naps. What does it look like? Well, in the field, we can identify a, a sort of melting front with a transition from metatextite with leucosomes enclosed in the semi-metatic foliation, uh, all the way to diatexites with uh, remnants of the paragnases uh, forming rafts into a quartz flow what's first part dominating uh, matrix. And it looks like here, uh, well, I mentioned here, partial melting affected the sedimentary cover because it was an, one uh, hypothesis was that this uh, mimetic core corresponded to a uh, various kind of basement relative to the Mesozoic marble and schist series. Well, here we see that uh, the partial melting is actually cross-cutting this, uh, this transition and uh, probably and even the, the fact that we we even find marble into the migmatites shows that partial melting uh, is not restricted to a, uh, a former basement and is affecting the root series, if a basement there was. These migmatites, so they, they, they are uh, metatexites with a continuous syn migmatitic layering grading into diatexites and even leucogranite that, are, that is found usually with diatexites in the core of the dome. At the thin section scale, these show uh, rather close to magmatic textures, slightly overprinted some locally by high, high uh, temperature uh, solid state deformation. But most of it is uh, very uh, nice metatexite diatexites with magmatic fabric. So this was the work of Seth Kuckenberg uh, during his PhD. And he really did a wonderful uh, structural analysis of the core of the dome, uh, where he mixed uh, very intensive field, field work, field observations, structural analysis, combined with uh, the analysis of the magnetic fabric, which allowed him to really reconstruct the foliation pattern within the, the first of the dome that is represented here in pink. And this analysis allowed to identify subdomes, so second order domes within the first order dome that are delineated by the pattern of the migmatitic foliation. And uh, we, we defined the, in this way uh, uh, four to five subdomes within the first order dome. Uh, the nice thing about the, mag magnetic, uh, the magnetic fabric is that it also gave us. The, the lineation, generally north, east, southwest trending as in the schists and marbles, but around the second of the dome, the lineation is actually radial around the subdomes. 
So with this data, uh, we, uh, we discussed the previous models and uh, we, we, we think we had the, we couldn't find uh, evidences for fold interferences, which would have affected similarly the basement and the cover uh, here with uh, model A. Uh, and this is mostly because uh, obviously the structure in migmatites is totally disconnected and is not uh, reproduced in the, the marble and schist series. Uh, we also uh, disputed the model of uh, isostasy dominated flow, which invoked two subdomes separated by a uh, high strain zone. And this is, and the high strain zones might be here. Uh, well, this might be actually uh, uh, applied to part of, uh, which might account for part of the structural record of the magnetites, as we see these high strain zones separating two large subdomes. But the fact that these subdomes are themselves subdivided into uh, smaller subdomes uh, is uh, not consistent with uh, this, uh, this model of isostasy dominated flow, at least at first order. So then we propose that uh, these subdomes reflect uh, gravitational instabilities, either diaperic instabilities and or uh, convection. To further investigate the, the, the dynamics of these, these partially molten rocks, we in, uh, performed uh, uranium lead dating of zircons. Uh, actually, this started with the PhD of Laure Martin in 2004 or three or four. Uh, and uh, what she distinguished here are two different types of zircon grains. Some of them are very uh, heterogeneous, porous, with full of inclusions. Others have a very nice inherited core, but both of these uh, zircon cores are surrounded by rims that are either nicely, finely uh, zoned here, or more complexly zoned here, that is interpreted as a cycle of uh, dissolution precipitation around the, the old inherited core. And all these uh, rims yield Young, much younger ages than the cores, which are in the, in the, in the, in the bracket from 24 to uh, 16 million years. And at first with law, we, we thought that we could, all, we could put all these uh, ages in, in one uh, event, which would yield here an average of 18.7 plus or minus 2.4 billion years, million years, sorry with here the, in light green, the, the two sigma uh, uh, stand, uh, standard deviation. But looking uh, at this, you know, more uh, in details in, in this uh, data set, we realized that, well, not all of the data overlap with this, um, with this average. So another way to look at this data is to consider that these different sets, subsets of the data corresponds each of them to uh, distinct ages, and which is uh, uh, consistent with the mean standard weighted deviation closer to one compared to the obtained on these subsets, compared to the, uh, the mean standard weighted deviation of 65 obtained from the rule data set. So if this is true, instead of considering these data is representing only one event. These, are, these subsets correspond to age, distinct ages in the zircon. What do they mean? Uh, well, this was already, had been already identified by Suke during a PhD and published in 2001. And she, had, she proposed at the time that these cyclic, uh, this cyclic dissolution and precipitation of one to two million years represented pulsative circulation of fluids through the rocks that would be recorded by uh, dissolution and precipitation of zircon. Well, this might work, but we didn't find, uh, uh, didn't think we found some uh, evidences for, for alteration and hydrothermal uh, alteration of these rocks. And as an alternative, we, instead of having the isotherms move up and down with regard relative to zircons that would be fixed, we just changed the reference frame and uh, proposed that it's the zircon that moves relative to 
the isotherms. And in this case, if the zircon moves relative to isotherms, it, mean, it means that it goes from a, a temperature above 8 to 700 degrees down in the, in the lower crust where it reaches 900 degrees or so, uh, be, is then affected by the solution, moves up again uh, to lower temperature where zircon crystallizes and so on for cycles of one to two million years. And this might uh, reflect the behavior of zircon grains that are untrained in convection cells. Okay, uh, so now what happens in the, in the host rocks, in the mantle of this dome, in the marble and schist, well, they are uh, intruded by a network of granitic dikes that are seen here in white, which uh, display cross-cutting relationships that allow to reconstruct the uh, relative chronology. So we sampled the, the, the most transposed ones and obtained a, an age on monazite by uranium lead of 16 million years, and uh, that we compared with the age obtained on the, the youngest uh, uh, dikes that are cross-cutting the other ones with a magmatic fabric, and these yield an age on zircon of 13.3 million years. So about 3 million years difference between the, uh, the oldest and the youngest dike. And these dikes have recorded, according to their, their structural record, they have recorded the, the formation of the dome. Uh, and this, this age uh, gap between 16 and 13 is then taken as the time uh, required for the dome formation, which is 3 million years. Well, just before uh, summing, summing up for Naxos, I don't resist the pleasure to show you this example of cross-cutting dikes. So we yeah, wanted to, to do an exercise, but without my camera, it would be difficult. So I'll, I'll cut it short. Uh, we'll see here a first dike. Uh, try with my... Okay. So first dike here that is partially to totally transposed into the foliation that is cross-cut by another dike here, dike two, and dike one and dike two are in textual continuity with this uh, granitic pocket here. And it seems then, then they, that they are uh, coeval. So how do we, uh, I call this uh, dike the Mobius ring dike. Uh, how do we interpret this? Well, this means that Deformation and magma crystallization have a duration. So it's uh, probably uh, uh, not really pertinent to try to find uh, deformation age or magma crystallization age at uh, a, a, a time scale that is less than the error bar of our geochronological tools. Okay, let's sum up now for Naxos. So we, we can build up a, a two-stage uh, scenario with a first stage of convection during 8 million years recorded by zircon uh, geochronology, followed by a second stage of uh, exhumation and dome formation of the, the first of the dome that occurred during 3 million years. And this probably occurred during gravitational collapse uh, of the uh, Aegean belt. So then we wanted to, to check if this makes sense physically. And I asked uh, my, my colleague uh, Muriel Gerbeau uh, to investigate the Rayleigh number, uh, given the, the geological uh, parameters that I could provide with we could provide with uh, structural analysis and, uh, and geochronology. And if we consider a temperature difference of 200 degrees or an internal heating uh, by radiogenic decay of uh, potassium, thorium, and uranium, uh, taking the concentration of these elements into the rocks uh, of, of Naxos, this will, with uh, then a, a 
uh, temperature difference of uh, 200 degrees and a thickness of 10 to 20 kilometers for the, the zone of the partially molten zone. This then requires a viscosity of 10 to the 17 to 10 to the 18 Pascal second uh, for convection to occur. And these type of viscosities are uh, fairly consistent with what we know of the rheology of partially molten rocks. So this means that uh, at first order, this, uh, this model of uh, crossflow scale convection is, uh, is pertinent. So we also uh, try uh, to assess the velocity of the revolving revolution of zircon grains and the development of diaperic instabilities given the, the, the size of the domes and the recurrence uh, of dissolution precipitation cycles. And this yields a, a velocity of, of several centimeters per year, which is also consistent with this type of viscosity. So with this example, we show that uh, dome and subdomes, in other words, gravitational instabilities, uh, can form in the context of plate tectonics. So it's, uh, using other words, uh, it's, it says that the, the fact that there are gravitational instabilities recorded in the, in the in the geology of an area doesn't say that there was no plate tectonics. The second example I want to go through more briefly is the variscon crust that is exposed in the area and uh, also the, uh, the, in the Southern Alps, which exposes a continuous section of more than 20 kilometer long uh, through the variscon crust from the Moho here on the, on the Northwest to volcanoes of Carboniferous age in the southeast. Uh, this continuous section star starts from the southeast with vol Carboniferous uh, volcanics and uh, sediments, fractal sediments, that are overlying a section of metasediments here in uh, salmon colors uh, made of metasediments so affected by uh, green cheese to amphibolite fishes, intruded by uh, Permian granitic plutons in, in red, uh, and then the middle crust is made of uh, amphibolite fascious migmatites of the same type of uh, protolith as the, the green cheese fascious ones. And, is, and of, uh, the, 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 the lower crustal part is made of granulite uh, fascious migmatites with felsic and uh, mafic uh, protolith. All these are introduced by a, a mafic to ultra mafic complex in dark green which is uh, thicker here in the, in the south than in the north. So what we did in the, in the frame of the, of the master project of Celia Gerbouz is to sample along two sections across this various uh, crust, one close to the, the thickest part of the uh, mafic or tramafic complex and one uh, in the thinnest part. Uh, the, the, yeah, the amphibolite to granulite facious uh, metamorphic gradient is consistent with the geothermal gradient of about 30 degrees per kilometer. So in the upper structural level, the, the metasediments are characterized by detrital grains, which yield uh, older and variscan, actually Precambrian ages. Amphibolite, uh, lower amphibolite fascias uh, are characterized by inherited cores with similar ages as the detrital grains of the higher structural level, but are, that are surrounded by rims that are uh, younger, that are very common in age. And we can also identify different uh, sets of rims, rim one, rim two. And then in uh, granulite fascias and uh, uh, upper amph amphibolite fascias, the, the cores tend to be resorbed and even totally disappear in granulite fascious uh, rocks with a dominantly various ages that are spreading several tens uh, that are spreading along the Concordia for several tens of million years. So if one applies a statistical tool to these uh, data sets, we can identify peaks in, the, in ages. Um, with each of them would, would correspond, would give uh, an, an average. And this is true for amphibolite fascias, but also for granite fascias. But if we compare then the 
the H peaks obtained at different structural levels. You can see that there is a systematic shift in, uh, in the age uh, population from amphibolite to granulite fish. And what we can see is that there is a systematic uh, relationship between R1 and the stubby zircon that are older than R2 uh, rims. And also the full population, so the, the, the R1 are indicated in, in black here, the R2 in, uh, in orange and the stubby zircon, that are the metamorphic high temperature zircons are indicated in blue and are predominantly observed in, uh, in the granite facious rocks. Taken generally, uh, overall, this overall population is younging also from amphibolite to granulite facies. And most of all, the peaks are not con consistent with each other, they're not correlated to each other at a different structural level. So which means that uh, there is no such thing as a metamorphic event that would have affected the full crust, the wool crust. Uh, similarly, the age peaks are not correlated with the age of the mafic to ultra mafic complex, which rules out uh, direct impact of the emplacement of these rocks on the metamorphic uh, gradient recorded by the, the low crust. Although we can find uh, in the monazite data, a uh, slight uh, younging or correlation in age very close to the contact uh, in this IZ113 sample. But it's not true if as, as soon as we leave a, a few hundred meters to a kilometer away from that uh, mafic to uh, ultra mafic complex, the, the correlation doesn't hold. So what we can gain from this example is that uh, well, the, the, these events of magma emplacement and metamorphism spread over tens of million years. And the conclusion is that protracted partial melting and crystallization occurred in this uh, lower variscan crust over more than 80 million years. So the last example is taken out the Grenville province. And here we focus only on one sample uh, and the Grenville province was the, 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 the target of the PhD of uh, Francois Turlin, who worked on pegmatites, rare, rare earth, rare metals, sorry, rare metal bearing pegmatites. But he also uh, studied the, the general geological context. I want here to focus on one particular sample of pegmatite from the uh, Aloctonus belt of the Grenville belt, which uh, shows a nice magmatic texture and yields uh, contains monazite that are here included in garnet, but also in, uh, in the quartz of ferspatic matrix, but also apatite has a very nice magmatic texture uh, associated with uh, quartz with uh, low bit boundaries and uh, uh, filling up uh, interstices between ferspars, uh, but very nice uh, magmatic texture. And the surprise was to, to get ages of these monazite that are older than the apatite ages, but older for more than 70 million years. And uh, while well, this had been previously interpreted as, as reflecting hydrothermal alteration in pulses affecting these rocks, but as we, you can see here, there's no signs of, the, of such an alteration. So we proposed an alternative model whereby this difference in age between uh, 1080 and 960 reflects flow, slow cooling and crystallization of the partially molten aloctonus belt from uh, 800 degrees, more than 800 degrees, down to 500 degrees, which corresponds to the closure temperature of appetite in such rocks. So this provides a record of partial melting and crystallization cooling over 70 million years is the same order of magnitude as for the various compressed. Uh, here we are done now with the uh, Jungen and Archean examples. And I uh, we'll, would like now to, to use these examples to investigate further the, the uh, geochronologic and metamorphic record of Archean cratons. And we first here uh, performed a very simple uh, thermal modeling 
with the, the, just the heat equation in one dimension in the diffusive equilibrium. And the idea is that uh, using present day surface heat flux that uh, we know, making an assumption on the mantle heat flux and uh, assumptions of the, on the thickness of the lithosphere and the crust, we can uh, calculate the, the content in heat producing elements, uranium, thorium, and, and uh, potassium, and uh, use that concentration in these heat producing elements to recalculate the geotherm uh, during time, and especially during the Archean, uh, taking into account the decay constant of, these, uh, of, of the radiogenic isotopes. Indeed, we have a, a fairly good idea of the surface heat flux around cratons, and taking an average of, uh, of 45 milliwatt per cubic meter. Uh, we also have a good idea, a fairly good idea of, uh, well, uh, of the crossover thickness uh, with an average of 40 kilometers, and an, uh, of the lithospheric thickness, we took here an average of 225 kilometers. And with this uh, sort of generic features for an Archean craton, we recalculated the geotherm at 3.5 million years, billion years, and obtained a ge geotherm that is consistent with the metamorphic record of, the, of these cratons, uh, namely between seven and 900 degrees for uh, the portion of crust that is below 20 kilometers, which means that this portion of crust was partially molten. Uh, well, this was no surprise, but then the, the, the next step was to recalculate the, the evolution of the, the geotherm at 3 billion years, 2.5 billion years, 1.5 billion years, etc. Et and this uh, pointed or made, made us realize that, well, this, uh, this decrease in temperature is fairly low, slow, and it might um, imply that the crust was partially molten for, 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 for these Archean cratons for about 1 billion years. And we, we played with statistics, that is uh, the work of, uh, the, with the help of David Baratou, played with statistics around uh, the average uh, characteristics of, uh, uh, of the crust of the Archean cratons and uh, playing with that, the average temperature at 3.5 giga years was somewhere between 850 and 900 degrees. The solidus at the Moho was uh, somewhere uh, reached uh, at around 2.7 giga years after cooling uh, of uh, 2.7 giga years. And all this, uh, leads to the conclusion that partially molten crust below 25 kilometers crystallized and cooled over 1 billion years, over the, the course of the Archean, basically. So to sum up, Phanerozoic and Archean uh, results, we, uh, we identified that, uh, well, the gravitational instabilities might account for the record uh, of uh, zircon crystallization and, and the dissolution cycles of one to two million years. Uh, crystallization of the Variscan Grenville lower crust might have occurred uh, during 70 to 80 million years, and the thermal modeling of Archean craton uh, might push this, uh, this duration for the slow cooling and crystallization over one billion years. So taking these ideas and having these ideas in mind, we, we, we then uh, might propose a, a different model that doesn't imply an external input of heat or, or, or geodynamic uh, setting in order to explain the protracted and the prolonged widespread magmatic and high temperature metamorphism record of Archean uh, cratons. And instead, this, this same uh, set of data might be explained by uh, recurring convective instabilities uh, during the course of the Archean, followed by and differentiation 
at the end of the Archean with uh, emplacement of more uh, evolved granitic uh, plutons. And I would like to finish uh, this talk, if I have time, I guess it's just time, with two movies. Uh, that is the, the, the work of uh, Aurélie Louis Napoleon during a PhD. Uh, and it's, uh, part of it is uh, it's now uh, submitted for, for publication and part of it has been already published. And the idea here was to, to investigate this, this behavior of the, of the dynamics of partially molten coastal routes using a, a volume of fluid method that uh, keeps track of uh, interfaces uh, better than uh, finite element uh, methods uh, and in, in which we have um, uh, used heterogeneities in density and viscosities into a matrix with a bulk uh, with bulk properties and this uh, uh, this medium with, with bulk properties as a viscosity that evolves as a function of, of uh, temperature which is, uh, and similarly for the, the, uh, the heterogeneities within this uh, partially molten uh, medium. And it's, uh, uh, um, so it's, it's deforming relative to uh, another vis viscous uh, layer in blue here, but which has a viscosity representing non-molten, unmolten uh, rocks. So I've moved to the, to the movie. And here we have two types of uh, behaviors. The first one, sorry, I need to stop that. Now I need to move here. Okay. So we have two, two grids here. Uh, the heterogeneities up to the left, we have only uh, viscosity and temperature that are shown. Sorry, viscosities and temperature that are shown. Uh, the, the lines are representing temperatures and the, the color scheme is uh, viscosity. And to the right, we have all the heterogeneities that are activated at the time the, the melting front is uh, 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 moving upward. And the temperature here is fixed at the beginning, beginning and uh, is uh, actually uh, increased suddenly from, uh, if I remember correctly, 600 degrees to uh, 1,000 degrees, and then it's propagating upward by diffusion. And uh, we take also into account here heat production within the, within the crust. So we'll see what it does. And uh, in the first step of the model, you see here segregation of the light white heterogeneities towards the, the top of the of the partially molten layer. At the same time, here the dark, more dense heterogeneities are accumulating at the base of the partially molten layer. And then at some point, the partially molten layer be becomes unstable. The, uh, the white, uh, less dense heterogeneities start to coalesce and form small scale domes that are about the size of the subdomes. Uh, identified in Naxos, for example. And then at some point, the full system becomes, uh, uh, it starts to, to develop another type of instability, a convective, a post dipyric instability, and then a convective instability with heterogeneities that are moved up and down in the, in the crust. Sorry. And the end, the end product of this, uh, this model is that there is redistribution of heterogeneities within the crust owing to these uh, gravitational instabilities with dense material accumulated at the base and lighter material uh, accumulated at the top of the partially molten layer. So this might be a, a way to uh, explain crustal differentiation. So now let's, I will show you the last, the other model. 
Just Alex, can you just uh, confirm that we can see the model one, one second? Yeah, yeah, we, so we see still the first model. The first model, okay, so now I move to the other one. Oh yeah, it's okay. still moved. So yeah, I, now we see the second one, yep. I need to- Sorry, I think it just lagged. That's no, so it's okay, it's okay. Difficult to, to jump from one to the other. Okay, so I need to stop this one. Okay, so this is the second model. So this, in this model, there's, there are the same type of uh, heterogeneities, but the viscosity of the partially molten layer and the density uh, gradient, I think, is uh, greater. So the, the dynamics will be more vigorous. And see here that convection is much more efficient at redistributing particles into the model, which leads to uh, redistribution and suspension, what we call suspension of particles into the convective cells. Okay. So what do we gain from that? So I'll jump back to my presentation here. So we have these, these models that develop, that go through different stages. First, segregation of uh, heterogeneities according to their uh, density. Then diapiric instability followed by convection, and this yields to crustal differentiation. And according to the, to the viscosity of the uh, partially molten layer, we have different, uh, and, and also the unmolten layer, the, the contrast in viscosity, we have different modes or regimes in, in, uh, in these uh, gravi uh, in gravitational instabilities uh, with convection with layering that is in the corner with a, uh, relatively high viscosity of the unmolten layer and suspension, which is uh, favored by a low viscosity of the unmolten layer, but also a low viscosity of the molten layer. Okay, so I'll leave you with these uh, conclusions that, uh, uh, well, the, the, the geological record in terms of structure, geochronology, metamorphism, of these Archean cratons uh, might be explained by uh, internal dynamics of and uh, uh, slow crystallization and cooling, but very intense uh, gravitational instabilities that might or not be connected to plate tectonics or mantle plumes, uh, but might also be uh, totally disconnected. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thanks a, uh, thanks a whole lot for that, Olivier. Uh, we will transition to our discussion, question and discussion portion. Um, usually takes a few minutes for people to uh, get their questions together. Well, Alex, as, uh, since we have a lag here, I wouldn't mind asking a couple of questions. Go right ahead, it's all yours. Yeah, you said there was no relationship between the underplating mafic ultramafic complex and the metamorphism in the Alps. But when you showed your diagram, the age bracket of your mafic ultramafic overlapped with the granulite grade. And presumably those intrusions will cool just as slowly as the metamorphic rock. So doesn't that mean there's a link? Well, it's, it's yeah, it might be a bit uh, uh, caricatural to say that there's no link. But uh, uh, what if I can put the, the picture again? Show you. It's it's not a direct link or a one-to-one -one link. That's that's what I meant. What I should show here. I guess what I'm I'm trying to say is yeah, I, I, I share with with the with the screen. No? Yeah. What I'm trying to say is if you emplace a really thick underplate like that, that metamorphoses the crust, the underplate's gonna cool as slowly as the crust. 
So, but not really, because the, the underplate is coming from a, a region of the Earth that is a much uh, higher in temperature. And probably the, 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 the crystallization temperature of these uh, mafic rocks is, is closer to 1,000 degrees uh, compared to the, the, the temperature, melting temperature of uh, the crust that is closer to 700 degrees. So I think there might be a, a, a thermal a temperature contrast between... Come, I'll come back to that. Okay. Uh, so there's probably a temperature contrast between the, the mythic ultra mythic complex and the, the lower crust of several hundred degrees, which might account for relative rapid cooling uh, of the mythic ultra mythic complex. However, there are effectively peaks in this mythic ultra mythic complex. There are peaks in the ages. I also want to point it point out is that the total duration of uh, placement of mafic or mafic complex doesn't match the, the duration of amphibolite to granulite facious metamorphism. So it's in, in specifically amphibolite facious started before the emplacement of, of mafic rocks. Okay, this, this, is, uh, this is part of the answer. But of course, in terms of uh, increasing the temperature of the lower crust, uh, and placing high temperature magmas will still help. It doesn't, uh, uh, it will not, uh, what, what I, I dispute here is that it, it is the main uh, source of heat. I think it's one source of heat uh, combined with the others. Well, we, we can chat about it another time. Okay, so Jeff Moyen asks in the chat, uh, I'm going to read it all out. Um, unfortunately, I have to leave before the end of the discussion, but thanks for the great talk. I love the way you describe the structure and evolution of partially molten crust. A comment or question, most of what you describe seems to equally apply to the modern or the Precambrian crust. And in any case, your description by construction does not extend below the crust. In other words, as I think you mentioned, it is uh, model agnostic when it comes to plate tectonics or not, to, uh, i.e. to global planetary scenarios. It may, it may happen above a slab, Naxos, a flat slab, Grenville, perhaps no slab at all, Pilbara. In all cases, what you see is the same thing. So it brings to the question, can you use, can we use structural data or any data for that matter to discuss global planetary tectonics? <laughs> well, this is, yeah. that's maybe taking it a bit too far. What I would say is maybe, uh, yeah, using structural data on migmatites uh, might not be very helpful in such context. I mean, all migmatites are not uh, structured in domes. Uh, so what I wanted to show is, is that uh, there are domes that are not uh, Archeans. And, uh, and also there are domes that formed in context of plate tectonics. So this is this was well uh, quoted by, by Jean-Francois. Uh, but uh, saying, using this, this, uh, this data to say that structural analysis of any kind of rocks or any kind of nematite is useless to, to uh, decipher uh, global tectonics, I think is going a bit too far. All right, um, then Lyle has his hand up. So go ahead, Lyle. Uh, Olivier, uh, you didn't specifically state it, but uh, you inferred it. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, for the Pilbara, are you uh, saying that uh, the whole uh, lower crust, the whole uh, has, well, the lower to mid crust has uh, been molten and that we've had this uh, instability for that whole crust? I'm just wondering how, uh, you reconcile that with the observations for the the Pilbara that we uh, uh, have only a thickness of about 14 kilometers for what we see as these granite gneiss domes. So you see 14 kilometers for the for the, yeah, the thickness of the... the the calculations for the the Pilbara based on the gravity data mainly uh, suggesting that these granite gneiss domes are, uh, are only about 14 uh, kilometers thick and what we see beneath them 
as that we see juxtaposition of uh, different uh, terrains, different isotopic signatures with uh, preserved um, faults or shear zones separating the basement rocks. And so I just don't see how uh, this uh, numerical model that you showed uh, can be applied to the Pilbara, if that's what you're suggesting. So that's, that's what I'm uh, that would be my guess. Uh, well, the, the effectively the, the the 10 to 15 kilometer would be the the migmatites here represented in yellow, and below that I would guess that there are granite light facious mafic and uh, and felsic rocks that have a more residual uh, composition, which are comparable to to uh, well, if, of course they would be different from the ones that are observed in the Variscan but uh, comparable in terms of uh, what they represent relative to the migmatites. But I'm not, I'm not so familiar, I have to say, I'm not so familiar with the, uh, the, uh, the Pilbara. I hope to, to be able to work there in, in, in the recent future. But uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be, I'd be uh, interested in seeing what kind of data allow to distinguish terrains beneath the domes. Because then the, the, the other reasoning is that the domes are about 30 kilometers in diameter or 20 to 30 kilometers, which hmm. gives you an idea of this, the, the scale of these uh, gravitational instabilities. 20 yeah, to 30 well, is, is the, almost the thickness of the crust in these areas. Yes, well, I mean, that's where the saying that uh, the lower crust that uh, we do actually see uh, preservation of a lot of regional scale fault structures. And so, look, it's just a minor modification, but it'll be something that we can discuss again, just to be able to, you know, adapt perhaps the, the models to take into account the uh, geophysical observations. Okay. Because I, I followed your talk uh, two or three weeks ago, and I, I didn't see what kind of uh, geophysical data might, uh, might, might conflict with that idea, and, and also, uh, also how they, they match the, what you just said, the, the idea that we could distinguish different terrains at the crossover scale with the geophysical data. Well, it's with the, it's combining the geophysical data with the uh, isotope data from the okay. Geological Survey of Western Australia. Anyhow, that can be something we can discuss for okay, another right, time. Yeah, to see that. Okay, Jean, did you want to follow up with another question? Sure. Um, I wrote it down, but uh, the hottest temperature you got at the Moho was at 3.5, and it was, what, 800, 900. Yet the Neoarchean enderbites in the Superior, which are very abundant, have emplacement temperatures over 1,000. So fitting that in with, with your model, doesn't that require either a mafic underplate or loss of the subcontinental lithospheric mantle, allowing very much hotter mantle to ascend and underplate the crust? Sure. I mean, this. This. Uh, I mean, uh, even higher temperature will help definitely, and would uh, would uh, actually increase the, the duration of the, the cooling. Uh, again, this is very simple. Huh? This is a very simple model, and and uh, the idea is there is just to use the decay constant of uh, radiogenic elements in a sort of generic scenario, but then it would uh, have to be applied to each different case. Uh, taking into account the composition, the thickness of the crust, the, the thickness of the lithospheric mantle, to see how each of these different craters would have behaved uh, at, at, during Archean time. So this first order model is, uh, is just a very simple one to sort of give a, an average uh, idea of what could have happened. No, I get that. I, I, I think it's yeah. really nice to see that kind of modeling. But, you know, the assumptions baked in that you have a thick subcontinental lithospheric mantle. So that, that prevents heat from ascending efficiently. Sure. No, actually, it's not, it's not exactly that. Huh? So the, here, the, the, the thickness of the thermal lithosphere is actually increasing with time because we left the temperature uh, open here. We just controlled the, the heat flux from the mantle here. So there is actually a thickening of the thermal lithosphere. Of course, if you add some dynamics into that first order, I mean, uh, one dimension diffusive equilibrium model, if you add some dynamics, removal of the uh, lithospheric root, then it will, it will uh, increase the temperature at the, in the crust and will make more complex scenario. Here, it's a very simple scenario just to, well, change a bit our mind in the way we look at geochronologic data 
and uh, and also consider uh, the, the time scale of uh, the, the, the decay of radiogenic elements. And basically, the time scale of decay of radiogenic elements is on the order of a billion years. So the heat source the pro that is uh, required for melting the Archean crust is shutting down in the in the in a time scale of billion years. So it's you 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 wouldn't uh, uh, expect this crust to cool in a few million years if the heat source is decaying in a billion years. This is basically the reason. I mostly agree. <laughs> All right, we have no uh, no more questions at the moment, but I'll give people time, yep, a minute or two. I'm, I'm sorry to have uh, cut all discussion. My, my goal was exactly the, the contrary. But thanks to, to Jean and Lyle to, to keep the, the debate uh, lively. And uh... Sometimes people have to leave and it just doesn't work out. Well, as long as there's dead air, I thought that that the movie was great because it showed. I mean, you've shown how efficiently restites will accumulate at the Moho. Yeah, it's, so we, the difficulty here is is to keep track of these uh, heterogeneities, and also to integrate scales. At the moment, the heterogeneities uh, are on the order of seven hundred meters, which is not the scale of. My liquid solid segregation. The, the scale of liquid, liquid solid segregation should be on the order of centimeters to meters. So we are now working on uh, refining this, uh, these tools to be able to integrate these scales into the model. So here, basically, we consider that there was some segregation between melt and, liquid and solid at the 100 meter scale to generate these heterogeneities. And then we have partially molten rocks with different densities and viscosities that are redistributed during convection. This is basically the, the underlying uh, assumptions in terms of uh, log geologic logic, so to say. But we haven't uh, really uh, reached yet the, uh, the scale at which liquid solid segregation occurs. I think this is the next step. All right, well. Thank you very much, Olivia. This was great. And uh, you know, they definitely generated some good discussion. So well, thanks. Yep. Um, with that, I think we'd let, uh, we'll go ahead and wish everybody a, a good week, good rest of your week. And we'll see you, see you all next week. See you next week. Thanks again.